Thank you. Okay, that's on. Good. I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to participate in this symposium. Oh, good. And I want to thank everybody for coming out on this uh, rainy Sunday. What I want to talk about today is I want to talk about the, me the mechanisms of choice and how we make decisions, how those decisions go right, and how those decisions go wrong. And I'm going to start with what I kind of think is a very simple sentence, but a very deep one. And that is, the brain is a decision-making machine. And when I first started using this sentence, about a decade ago or so, I thought the hard word was the word brain. Because that's where the neuroscience is. That's, where the, that's what a neuron is. It's how neurons are connected up. There's a complexity there. But we are comfortable with that complexity. And then I said, OK, maybe the hard word is the word decision-making. But in fact, if you look, there are a dozen fields that have looked at the question of decision-making. And those fields all agree on the taxonomy of decision making, whether you're talking about neuroscience or psychology or behavioral economics or robotics. You come up with the same types of decision making. And it turned out, as I started talking to people, I started kind of presenting our work, that the hard word is the word machine. Because the word machine scares us. And the problem is, we don't know what it means to be a machine. What it means is, we are physical brains. It means that's what it means to be human. We are the brain within us. It means that the mind is the brain. And the problem is that that then leaves us this question of what does it mean to be a physical being? And I think it scares us because we're afraid we don't have the freedom to choose. And I'm going to argue today, what I'm going to do with my talk today is I'm going to convince you, I hope, that we still have the freedom to choose. The problem is that we haven't defined either the word freedom or the word choose. So let's be careful with our definitions. And so if we come in and we say, what is choice? What does it mean to choose something? I'm going to operationalize the word choice. And by operationalize, I mean define it in such a way that we can all agree that's a, that's a definition I can live with. I'm going to define it as what action should I take when? An action selection. And this works whether you're a rat deciding where food is buried, a monkey deciding where to look its eyes, a rat deciding how to run on this big maze like they do in my lab. But it also works if you're a student deciding just how much sugar you need to carry you through an all night of study. And I can tell you, as a former graduate student in computer science, I know exactly how much sugar I needed to carry me through a night of programming. Because too much and it doesn't work, and too little and it doesn't work. But it also works for very big decisions. Decisions like where are you going to go to college? Who are you going to marry? When you get married, you take an action. You stand in front of an audience and you say, I do. That is fundamentally an action. So our definition still works for big decisions, too. And it also works for negative decisions. Decisions of things like, should I go gamble all my money at the casino or in the stock market? Or should I take drugs or not? And that allows us to talk about all of this in terms of decision making. Now, when we define it that way, what we end up with is this idea that a decision is about selecting an action from previous information, from things like your past experience, your sensory cues, the world around you, and your goals. And this means it's really about information processing. And when we look at this from an information processing perspective, what information are you processing and how are you processing that information in order to take this decision? we find there are multiple ways to take those decisions. And that's going to be the key to our talk today. I'm going to talk about four ways that, in fact, all of these fields have defined as ways of processing this information. Now, the terminology I'm going to use is the terminology coming out of neuroscience. But if you're in one of those other fields, you'll recognize these ideas. The first is reflexes. A reflex is an action, and therefore, by our definition, it's a decision. And this, this is a scene from Lawrence of Arabia. Where, where Peter O'Toole, playing Lawrence, is showing off how tough he is by holding the match and letting it burn to his fingers and preventing his reflexes from taking the action, from making the decision to protect his fingers. And the way to understand this scene is there are two decision-making systems. One is the reflexes, the other we'll see in a few slides, that are in conflict here. The second of these four decision-making systems, I like to call Pavlovian because this is what Pavlov's dogs were doing. And this system is a set of species-specific behaviors, that is, behaviors that we as humans have because we're human, that we learn to release in the right time. 
And my favorite example is running from the lion. You don't get a chance to learn to run from the lion. You gotta get that right the first time. <laughs> so what you end up doing is you see the lion and you run, great. But the net, what you learn then, if you learn that when a lion is stalking you, that lion is, produces a rustle in the grass. And now you see the rustle in the grass, you feel fear, you notice the emotion. You feel fear and you run. And you can learn that the lion stalking you produces a rustle in the grass from lots of ways. It could be from hearing it at the campfire, it could be from seeing somebody else get eaten. But <laughs> at this point, the point is that you've learned to run from the lion. And this system can learn to run, but it can't learn to do jumping jacks. One of the most interesting things about the Pavlovian system is that in humans, one of the things that makes us human is that fairness is a species-specific behavior. We, particularly within our community, want to see fairness. And unfairness leaves us angry and disgusted. Notice, that's an emotion. And this is a scene from the British TV show Golden Balls, which is basically these two people are playing what's called a prisoner's dilemma game. They have a set of money that they can split, and they each get to pick a, uh, to either split the money or steal the money. If they both, pl if they both pick split, then they split the money 50-50. If they both pick steal, nobody gets anything. If one picks split and the other picks steal, then the person who picks steal gets all the money, and she is about to take all of his money. So that's two systems. The problem with those systems is they're kind of almost pre-wired. They're hard to modify. The Pavlovian system can learn when to release it, but as I said, you, have to, you can't learn the new actions. The two other systems are kind of much more, much broader. This third system we call is deliberation. And this is often what we think of when we think of as choosing. But we've talked about this in information processing. We need to be thinking about this in terms of what is the information processing that happens when we deliberate. What it turns out it is, is an imagination and evaluation step. <coughs> if I, for example, am trying to decide where am I going to take my family on vacation, and I say, well, I could go skiing, or I could go see Stonehenge. What I do is I imagine, what would that trip be like? How much would my kids like going skiing? How much would my, trip, my kids like actually seeing this ancient site? And then I evaluate, how good is that going to be? And one of the things that's interesting is now that we know about not only the information processing, but in fact the neural mechanisms of this, we can see this in animals as well. And in fact, I have data in my lab, this is the part of the reading rats' minds, that in fact, the rats, when they come to choice points and they kind of look back and forth, they imagine those futures just as humans do. And they evaluate those futures just as humans do. And they deliberate using the same brain structures that we as humans use, particularly a brain structure called the hippocampus. Now, hippocampus is often talked about as memory, but somebody who doesn't have a hippocampus, not only can they not remember their pasts, they cannot imagine their futures. So okay, deliberation is great, it's a very flexible system, but it's slow. And it's slow because you actually have to evaluate this, you have to imagine this future. And that leads us to the fourth system, which we call procedural. And procedural is basically, over time, you learn what is the situation in which I want to release this action I've trained myself up to do. And the classic example is sports, right? We don't have a Pavlovian species-specific behavior to swing a baseball bat. But Ted Williams, and this is a picture of Ted Williams, Ted Williams trained himself over many, many hours and many, many trials to be able to categorize the pitch coming at him, or whether it was a fastball or a curveball, high or low or whatever, and swing the bat correctly. And imagine if you were trying to deliberate over this. You know, well, okay, the pitch might be high. If it were high, I'd want to put my bat this way. If the pitch were low, but by this time, they've struck out. Right? You don't have time to deliberate, so you need this other system. And again, if we look in rats, what we find is that the brain structures that are involved in these decision-making systems are the same brain structures in rats and humans. And we have data from the dorsal striatum that when a rat is running on a task, it's the information about that task that gets stored. So on the left here, I don't know if I can actually do this with a laser, so I'm not going to try. But on the left here, we have what we call our multiple teammates, where the rat runs through a central track and turns left or right for food. <laughs> And in this maze, knowing where you are tells you everything about what you need to do. On the right, the rat actually starts at the bottom. I don't know if I can do this. Is this going to work? Yes, starts at the bottom 
and runs one, two, three, four, five to get food. And now the rat's here and has to run one, two, three, four, five to get food. And you can see that the food is precessing around the square. Knowing where you are isn't good enough. You've got to know, you've got to count to five. And the dorsal striatum in the second task learns the sequence, not the position. So just as Ted Williams learned to categorize baseball pitches, our rats learn to categorize the task they have to run. Now, if I were building a complete story of this, I would have to go through support systems, things like perception. Obviously, you have to perceive the world in order to take these actions. Situation recognition. You never step into the same river twice, but we always call it a river, right? You, if you've come into this auditorium before, you can recognize what the kind of scenario is of being in an auditorium. You have to recognize the situation. Obviously, we need motivational components, right? We need to do different things if you're hungry or if you're thirsty. And obviously, in the end, we need to be able to take the action. And one of the things that's interesting about that is we don't actually say, I'm going to lift my leg. We walk, right? And so you have other structures that have learned that know how to walk. And your decision system can say, it's time to walk here. I'm not going to go through these systems because, of course, that would run, run me out of time. Instead, what I want to talk about is the consequences of this story. Because we can now take an engineer's view on the system. This is, of course, the 35W bridge collapse from about seven years ago. And when we ask what caused this bridge failure, we, could, we go back and say, what was the set of causes? What were the set of failure modes within the machinery of the system? Well, if we had a machinery of the system, could we identify failure modes in humans? Maybe addiction is a failure mode of decision making. We have a machinery. This is the machinery of decision making. And we can come into this machinery and start to define failure modes. This is honestly right where the field is right now. This is where we are, do where we are going. And there are clinicians and theoreticians and neuroscientists and psychologists talking to each other to try to identify this so that we can start to say, that's not a cocaine addict. That's a person who has a Pavlovian problem. We're going to fix that Pavlovian problem. Or this person has a deliberative problem. We're going to fix that deliberative problem. And so we can get to the underlying causes of this rather than just the symptoms. Now, I don't like to talk about this only in the negative, because the reason that we have this set, this many sets of systems, is that it's also a positive thing. That is, we will do better if we select the right system at the right time. Right? I told you about Pavlovian is important for fairness. If you drive somebody to be too deliberative, actually they become amoral. If you drive somebody, if you're trying to, we want the procedural system when we have to act quickly. We need the deliberative system, you're going to do it once. You don't have time to learn which college is going to be good by trying 10,000 colleges. You have to, what you do is you imagine what would that college be like, and you take that choice. And so I want to come back, kind of the last few minutes of this talk, I want to come back to this final point, this sentence that I started with. The brain is a decision-making machine. And I want to come back to this point that we are physical brains, that the mind is the brain, that we have minds, but that mind is that physical brain that we are. And I want to come back to this question. Do we have the freedom to choose? And many of my colleagues, many neuroscientists, will often tell you that you are the deliberative system. You are this superficial piece on this surface. And I think that's fundamentally wrong. I think it's fundamentally unfair to who we are. When I feel fear, that's me feeling fear. When you're in love with somebody, you're in love with that person. You're in love, not me. It's not, that is the you who is in love with that person. And it is unfair to not call that part of you. And in fact, it's unfair to talk about somebody like Ted Williams who has spent thousands of hours practicing, or a musician who spent thousands of hours practicing to play their music. We need all of these systems. And I come back to this Walt Whitman quote. Do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitude. And I think it's important when we talk about this to talk about all of these systems as the person we are. That we are, in fact, this, and we are, the reason we have the freedom to choose is that we are 
all of these pieces, and they are all the pieces that make us up. And so I'm going to stop there, and um, thank you very much.